Senator from Nevada. Thank you. I'd like to continue finishing the letter from the Birmingham jail. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. Before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson etched the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history, we were here. For more than two centuries, our forebearers labored in this country without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters while suffering gross injustice and shameful humiliation. And yet, out of a bottomless vitality, they continued to thrive and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we face now will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. Before closing, I feel impelled to mention one other point in your statement that has troubled me profoundly. You warmly commended the Birmingham police force for keeping order and preventing violence. I doubt that you would have so warmly commended the police force if you had seen its dogs sinking their teeth into unarmed, nonviolent Negroes. I doubt that you would so quickly commend the policemen if you were to observe their ugly and inhumane treatment of Negroes here in this city jail. If you were to watch them push and curse old Negro women and young Negro girls. If you were to see them slap and kick old Negro men and young boys. If you were to observe them as they did on two occasions, refuse to give us food because we wanted to sing our grace together. I cannot join you in your praise of the Birmingham Police Department. It is true that the police have exercised a degree of discipline in handling the demonstrators. In this sense, they have conducted themselves rather nonviolently in public. But for what purpose? To preserve the evil system of segregation? Over the past few years, I have consistently preached that nonviolence demands, it demands that, we, that the means we, must, we use must be as pure as the ends we seek. I have tried to make clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to attain moral ends. But now I must affirm that it is just as wrong, or perhaps even more so, to use moral means to preserve moral ends. Perhaps Mr. Connor and his policemen have been rather nonviolent in public, as was Chief Pritchett in Albany, Georgia. But they have used the moral means of nonviolence to maintain the immoral end of racial injustice. As T.S. Eliot has said, the last temptation is the greatest reason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. I wish you had commended the Negro sit and demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage, their willingness to suffer, and their amazing discipline in the midst of great provocation. One day, the South will recognize its real heroes. They will be the James Merediths with the noble sense of purpose that enables them to face jeering and hostile mobs and with the agonizing loneliness that characterizes the life of the pioneer. They will be old, oppressed, battered Negro women symbolized in a 72-year-old woman in Montgomery, Alabama, who rose up with a sense of dignity and with her people decided not to ride segregated buses, and who responded with ungrammatical profundity to one who inquired about her weariness. My feet is tired. 
but my soul is at rest. It will be the young high school and college students, the young ministers of gospel and their host of elders, courageously and nonviolently sitting at lunch counters and willing to go to jail for conscience sake. One day, the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were, in reality, standing up for what is best in the American dream and for the most sacred values of our Judeo-Christian heritage, thereby bringing our nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the Founding Fathers in their formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Never before have I written so long a letter. I'm afraid it is much too long to take your precious time. I can assure you that it would have been much shorter if I had been writing from a comfortable desk. But what else can one do when he is alone in a narrow jail cell other than write long letters, think long thoughts, and pray long prayers? If I have said anything in this letter that overstates the truth, and indicates an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me. If I've said anything that understates the truth and indicates my having a patience that allows me to settle for anything less than brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our feared, drenched communities and, in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr. Mr. President, I, oh, I yield. Senator from Ohio. Uh, thank you, Senator Rosen. Uh, thank you to my colleagues who joined us today uh, to read these powerful words. Uh, Senators Warnock and Tillis and Casey and Capito and Bozeman and Rosen. Uh, this is a diverse group on the floor today whose states reflect the vi vibrant and wonderful diversity of our great nation from the Deep South to the Mountain West to the Industrial Midwest. We represent different places. We may disagree on many things but we love this country. We know we can do better for the people who make it work. Dr. King and the civil rights leaders of his generation did more than just about anyone to push this country to live up to our founding ideals and to make the dream of America real for everyone. Protesting, working for change, organizing, demanding our country do better, those are some of the most patriotic things all of us can do. That's Dr. King's charge in this letter. My favorite single line, certainly in this letter and maybe in all of Dr. King's preachings and teachings and writings, progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevi inevitability. It rolls in because we make it so. That is our charge. Think about, think about that campaign Dr. King was waging when he was martyred in Memphis. Think about who he was talking to. Union sanitation workers, local 1633, asked me. And think of the circumstances. This was a was very segregated Memphis. He was in a segregated white neighborhood. Even the sanitation truck uh, where these workers were working uh, was segregated. The, the cab of the truck was two white workers. The back of the truck was doing the actual lifting and picking up garbage were two black workers. And the, the, in February, Dr. King, after, before Dr. King first visited 
the garbage truck that the, was a torrential downpour in this white segregated neighborhood. There was nowhere for these black sanitation workers to go. They crawled in the back of the truck. It malfunctioned and crushed these two workers. That's why Dr. King was in Memphis the first time and the second time. He told these workers, what does it profit as he, as, he, as he wove together worker rights and civil rights and labor rights? He told these workers, what does it profit a man to be able to eat in an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't earn enough money to buy a hamburger and a cup of coffee? Those workers were vital to their community. They worked hard to provide for their families. They were denied fair pay, denied political rights, denied basic safety on the job. Uh, the presiding officer today is Senator, uh, Senator Cortez Masto from Nevada. He has joined in so many efforts on this Senate floor to fight for workers, to fight for the dignity of work, to fight for safety and civil rights and worker rights. It's not a coincidence that the workers who are so often the most exploited were low-income workers and especially black workers. Until all workers have the dignity they've earned, Dr. King's work will remain unfinished means paying all workers a living wage. It means giving them power over their schedule. It means providing good benefits, safety in the job. It means letting them, if they so choose, organize a union. That means all workers, it's about the dignity of work. All workers get a fair share of the wealth they create. When we empower workers, we bring us closer to the society Dr. King envisioned where all labor has dignity. Senator from Ohio. And President, I ask and ask and sent the Senate Judiciary Committee be discharged from further consideration of S. Res. 152 and S. Res. 185. The Senate now proceed to the end block consideration of the following Senate resolutions. S. Res. 152, S. Res. 185, S. Res. 192, S. Res. 193, S. Res. 194. Is there an objection? Without objection, the committee is discharged of the relevant resolutions. The Senate will proceed to the resolutions and block. I know of no further debate on the resolutions and block, Madam President. If there's no further debate, the questions on the adoption of the resolutions and block. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do. The resolutions are approved to on, in block. Madam President, I ask you consent that the penalty, that the preambles be agreed to, the motions to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table, all in block. Without objection. Madam President. Senator from Ohio. Thank you, Madam President. I uh, will speak briefly. I know we're expecting a vote at 5.30. I will uh, not speak nearly that long. But I, I know we are about to vote on the uh, Congressional Review Act on an issue that um, I happen to disagree with the President on. I've, my whole career has been standing up for workers. My whole career has been standing up uh, for uh, sometimes to presidents, presidents of both parties. And I think if you look at the history of trade in this country and what we've, what we've done, we've seen, frankly, that this body, that down the hall and the House of Representatives and in the White House have, have not, have historically not stood up for workers. I, I, used to, I, I grew up in Mansfield, Ohio, in a small industrial city, about 50,000 people. It was a very industrial city, less so now, but I went to Johnny Appleseed Junior High School and I remember walking the halls with the sons and daughters of machinists who worked at Tappan Stove uh, and rubber workers that worked for Mansfield Tire and steel workers at 
at Empire Detroit, Empire Detroit, Empire Reeves, I believe was the company's name then, uh, auto workers who worked at General Motors, a number of electrical workers at Westinghouse, and, Madam President, also the sons and daughters of, of people in the trades, electricians and carpenters, insulators and pipe fitters, plumbers and operating engineers and laborers, people highly skilled who build America. And as companies, as corporations, throughout the mid, particularly in my part of the country, but in Nevada, everywhere, corporations uh, began to shut down plants in the industrial Midwest. They moved those plants to low-wage areas, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, North and South Carolina especially. And because those wages weren't quite low enough to satisfy the greed, I think there's no other word, the greed of corporate America, uh, then those same companies began to lobby Congress. And my, one of my first votes as a member of Congress many years ago was in opposition to the North American Free Trade Agreement. And those of us who oppose NAFTA um, predicted with almost certainty what was almost certainly was inevitably going to happen. Once you, once you pass a trade agreement giving these companies the opportunity to go to Mexico and then to China at, with no tariffs, going for very low wages to exploit workers in those countries, which is what they did, um, you begin to see plants shut down. And uh, Madam President, we know, we know what happened. We know that far too many of our colleagues in the House and Senate uh, were willing to pass these trade agreements like NAFTA. We also know that uh, down the hall, the House of Representatives did the same thing. The Senate did it. And frankly, we had presidents of both parties who sold out American workers. And the lobbyists were here pushing for NAFTA, pushing later for PNTR with China, weakening the rules there so that these companies, um, they, they, were, they were up and gone. They, they, left, uh, they left Ohio, they left Indiana, they left Illinois, they left uh, so much of the industrial Midwest. Uh, and because, because this Congress and presidents of both parties, from Trump all the way back to Clinton, I would include Obama and Bush, both Bushes, and, and Clinton and, and Trump, that they were willing to sell out American workers to the lobbyists who pushed for these trade agreements that they could seek cheaper wages in China. And an, another thing that happened with China, Madam President, was that uh, what we did when we moved all these jobs to China was we built up the Chinese military because we provided the technology and the wealth to the Chinese Communist Party, who then were able to build up a high-tech military not quite rivaling ours, but certainly, uh, certainly dangerous enough that we paid attention. The vote, my vote against NAFTA was one of my proudest votes, um, and my vote against PNTR with China, most favored nation status for China. So we're seeing what that has yielded. Um, in the end, it's a simple choice. Whose side are you on? Are you the side of the Chinese Communist Party or the side of American workers? And that, to me, what is what this vote is about today, the Congressional Review Act about solar tariffs. I would add, full disclosure, one of the biggest solar manufacturers, I believe still the biggest single solar manufacturing plant in America, is near Toledo, just south of Toledo in northwest Ohio. Um, those workers will benefit if we vote yes and then override the president's veto. Um, it's what I urge my colleagues to do today, to pass this simple resolution, uh, to continue um, these tariffs on China, because as long as they keep cheating, as long as American companies are willing to, um, to take the products from s slave labor and underpaid labor and exploited labor and bring them into this country, these, these problems will continue for our industrial base. I, I heard the President of the United States uh, down the hall at the, at the um, I believe it's the last State of the Union, saying the term Rust Belt, we are burying the term Rust Belt. Um, I have talked to the President about burying that term. He mentioned it that day on um, the State of the Union that evening. And mostly we're starting to in this country. We're seeing a reindustrialization of America. We're seeing chips now. Chips were invented in the United States. Ninety percent of them were made mostly in Taiwan and China. Um, the light bulb yeah, it was invented by an Ohioan, Thomas Edison, not far. He grew up not far from where I grew up. Um, now, 100 percent of LEDs are made overseas. So if we're going to reindustrialize this country, bring these jobs back, that's what the CHIPS, that's what the CHIPS legislation is all about. That's what uh, we are doing um, with Intel in Columbus. This sets us back. This, this um, president's veto of this bill um, sets us back uh, a couple more years in, in re redeveloping, bringing these jobs back. Uh, doing the kind of insourcing that 
that President Senator Casey and others have fought for here. So I might ask my, I'll wrap up asking my colleagues to vote uh, vote yes on this Congressional Review Act on solar tariffs because, again, it's who side you on? Are you on the side of the Chinese Communist Party or on the side of American workers? To me, it's as clear as day um, which side to be on. Thank you, Madam President. Senator from Kansas. Uh, are we in a quorum call? No, we are not. Madam President, uh, thank you very much. Today, in fact, just a, a few hours, a few minutes from now, the Senate will act uh, on uh, an effort to protect farmers, ranchers, and producers from the unnecessary consequences of the listing of the lesser prairie chicken. Uh, this, even as I say the words, it brings back so many instances in which we've had this conversation on the Senate floor going back to my earliest days in the Senate, this issue has been with us now for a long number of years. Range-wide studies over the last decade have shown that conservation efforts are helping bird populations in the five habitat states, including Kansas. So the lesser prairie chicken is, is a native bird to five states in our part of the country. And its uh, populations are important to us in Kansas and to those other states and to the country. But what strikes me is that this administration claims that American agriculture is at the heart of needing to list the lesser prairie chicken as either an endangered species or a threatened species because agriculture is causing harm to the populations. A quote from the rule state, quote, grazing by domestic livestock is not inherently detrimental to lesser prairie chicken management and in many cases is needed to maintain appropriate vegetative structure a pretty good paragraph to indicate the value of production agriculture when it comes to the well-being of the lesser prairie chicken. In other words, what that's saying is that agricultural management practices and voluntary conservation practices of grasslands, including grazing by ranchers, improve, improve the habitat. Listing the bird as a threatened and endangered species is not the answer. Plain and simple, we need more rainfall. We need moisture in Kansas and other states in the West we need more rainfall, not more regulations. I conclude here by saying that farmers and ranchers have always been and will always be the original conservationists. Their livelihood depends upon the continued conservation efforts of the soil and the water they use to produce crops and raise livestock. I am confident there are ways to conserve the species without hindering economic opportunity in rural communities and I will continue to push for what Kansans have been pursuing for years now, voluntary solutions. Madam, Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Florida. Madam President, I would take a moment to address some of what we heard here on the Senate floor today. There have been a lot of accusations made about what this CRA does, and I'll clear that up in a minute. But first, I'd like to set the record straight on what this measure does not do. My colleagues often talk about their work to protect human rights. 
I'd ask the simple question, what could possibly be, greater, be a greater threat to human rights than the United States of America turning a blind eye to child slave labor? What message does it send to the world? We've heard here today that this measure will force American companies to pay for these tariffs. Not true. Madam President, what this measure does do is rightfully punish foreign companies that are actively working to get around U.S. trade law and help import product made with slave and child labor into the United States. The only entities who will pay tariffs are Chinese affiliate manufacturers. If you're doing the right thing, this measure doesn't change a darn thing about how you do business. But if you're working with people who believe slavery has a role in supply chains, you're darn right I have a problem with that and will do whatever I can to stop it. Madam President, I also heard today that the rule that this CRA would eliminate was negotiated by the solar panel industry. We've heard that the solar panel industry agrees we need this exemption and therefore it's good. Of course, the solar panel industry that supports the rule is the Chinese solar panel industry. American manufacturers do not. Thanks to the Biden administration's waiver that we are working to repeal here today, Chinese companies have been given everything they need to dominate the solar market just like how Russia has dominated cheap gas supply to Europe. Madam President, I've also heard some of my colleagues say that this CRA is unnecessary because we've already passed a law that says products made with slave labor cannot be sold in the United States. We did pass a good bill that prevents products made with slave labor from being sold here, and I thank God we did that. But since when has U.S. law meant anything to Communist China? We know companies controlled by the CCP lie, cheat, and steal. We know that companies in Communist China are moving solar panels made with slave and child labor to other countries to circumvent our laws, and they aren't being caught. President Biden's own Commerce Department has proven that to be true. When half the world's solar panels are coming from a region with well-documented child and slave labor, are we really expected to believe that the companies making these panels aren't using slave labor? No, we know that's not reality. Finally, Madam President, I've heard the claim that this CRA will somehow be terrible for American jobs. This one actually surprised me. Here's, that, here's how that logic goes. Letting communist China dominate a market by using slave and child labor is better than supporting American manufacturing and American jobs here at home. Let me know if you can figure that one out, see how that makes sense. Some of my colleagues on the left claim that 30,000 jobs will be lost. That's not even close to being true. Guess who gave them that information? The Chinese-dominated Solar Lobby Group. Yes, the same group who is perfectly happy to keep things the way they are so they can make a buck on the back of slave and child labor. Now, when I went to look at this report today, I couldn't find it. It's not on their website. This is what you get when you try to look at their so-called analysis. Sorry we couldn't find that page. Honestly, I think our colleague from Pennsylvania got it exactly right when he told a news outlet this week, too often China gets away with undermining our markets, undermining our companies, and every time they cheat, we lose jobs in Pennsylvania. Senator Casey is right. It's not just true in Pennsylvania, it's true in every state across our great country. Senator Wyden is right too. Discussing the same issue, he said, red, white, and blue manufacturing particularly now when people see we're serious about it, that's the key time in this two-year window when the Chinese can hit us. To be honest, Madam President, I'm shocked by excuses from some of my colleagues. I note that it's only some because this CRA is actually a bipartisan bill. The excuses for inaction by some on the left doesn't make sense to me. What we are talking about tonight is whether anything is worth turning a blind eye to slavery and child labor. The Chinese-dominated industry has agreed that this waiver is a good thing. What a shocker. What some of my colleagues on the left are saying is that the endorsement of Chinese manufacturers is enough to turn a blind eye to slave and child labor. I clearly disagree. When this rule, with this rule repealed by this CRA, tariffs first put in place by President Obama's Commerce Department to hold Chinese manufacturers who violated our trade laws accountable will be reinstated, forcing companies to work with only those partners who aren't actively involved in slave and child labor. Madam President, to say what a good thing for the Senate is, to, to that I say what a good thing for the Senate to put it behind us and to support it. President, she is a dictator.
and human rights violator. Violator. He is yet another communist leader trying to be the dominant world player. The Chinese Communist Party has stripped the people of Hong Kong of their freedoms. They've cracked down on distance, militarized the South China Sea, threatened Taiwan, and surveilled its citizens, and committed a genocide against the Uyghurs simply because of their religion. We know the Chinese Communist Party will do anything to destroy America. The national security threat of Communist China cannot be taken lightly. And the human rights abuses against the Uyghurs, including slave labor, child labor, and genocide, cannot be ignored. The United States cannot tolerate Communist China's horrific human rights abuses and genocide of Uyghurs. In addition to this, Communist China will stop at nothing to exploit American markets and take advantage of U.S. investors and companies doing business within its country. Communist China poses a clear and present threat to the United States and the world. In 2022, the Department of Commerce caught Communist China circumventing U.S. trade laws to avoid American tariffs. To avoid American tariffs, Xi's regime started sending Chinese-made solar products made with slave labor to Southeast Asian countries, claiming they're made in the corresponding nation. So here's what they were doing. They made them, it was made here, then they shipped them down here and said they were made here and shipped them here so they didn't have to, uh, to pay the tariffs. These Chinese-made products, again, made with slave and, ch and child labor. And you can see this is some of the, you know, there's not a lot of pictures that come out of, uh, out of this area, but these are some of the Uyghurs. And they're, they're clearly being put to work uh, to do whatever the Communist Party wants them to do. These Chinese-made products, again, made with child and slave labor, were then imported to the U.S. Despite his own Department of Commerce investigation, President Biden issued an emergency declaration exempting these Chinese-made solar products. Again, may with slave and child labor from our trade laws for a full two years. President Biden's solar emergency declaration is a giveaway to President Xi and the Chinese Communist Party. It's a massive gift to a regime that is using slave and child labor, a favor to an evil regime that wants to destroy our great country. There is no other way to describe it. The declaration allows Communist China to circumvent U.S. trade laws with impunity and continue to dominate the solar industry at the expense of American manufacturers and American jobs. It's an approval of slave and child labor. It's anti-American jobs. Communist China's solar manufacturing is based on forced labor, government subsidies, and trade abuses. Communist China isn't doing the United States any favor through their dominance of the solar industry. We are building dependence on them. Even today, Communist China is using forced labor to produce solar panels. Purchasing these solar panels is helping fuel these human rights abuses. Because of this, the Uyghur Human Rights Project has announced its support of this CRA. So this is why we're taking this vote today. This CRA will, would reinstate the Department of Commerce's own findings that certain companies in Southeast Asian countries are acting in violation of U.S. law by importing Chinese-made solar products, again made with slave labor. Therefore, tariffs should apply to these specific bad actors. The tariffs would only apply to these companies. It would not apply to any other industry or to any companies who are lawfully importing solar products, not made with slave labor, into the U.S. This, pro, this measure is pro-American jobs and anti-Chinese forced and child labor. It's that simple. Passing this CRA will send a message to President Xi and Communist China. When you break American trade laws and use slave labor, you pay the price. Under the leadership of my friend and fellow Floridian, Congressman Bill Posey, this CRA has already passed the House with bipartisan support. Now it's time for the Senate to finish the job in Congress and send this to President Biden's desk. This isn't partisan, it's about human rights. Madam President, I will not stand by, and I hope the U.S. Senate will not stand by and accept excuses to turn a blind eye to Communist China's human rights atrocities. The United States is the beacon of freedom to people all over the world. Voting tonight against holding accountable those who enslave others, including children, will be a stay in our nation that the freedom-loving people of the world will not soon forget. I look forward to all of my colleagues supporting this CRA, and I yield the floor.
President. Senator from Kansas. I ask unanimous consent to use a prop during my remarks. Without objection. Madam President, today I rise in support of SJ Resolution 9, providing for congressional disapproval of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service's rule regarding the lesser prairie chicken under the Congressional Review Act. Madam President, since I was 10 years old, my family's enjoyed hunting prairie chickens. As a matter of fact, the first bird I ever shot, the first time I ever go, I ever went hunting, 10 years of age with a 20 gauge single shot shotgun, I was able to down one of these beautiful birds. But last November, the Fish and Wildlife Services ignored decades of voluntary conservation efforts and published a rule listing the lesser prairie chicken species as endangered and threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Enacted in 1973, the Endangered Species Act, the ESA, was created to protect species believed to be on the brink of extinction. Today, the consequences of this law reach far beyond its original intent. If saving species were the only consideration, then this administration wouldn't be listing the lesser prairie chicken, whose population is considered stable in my home state of Kansas. I ask you, was the ESA made for the good of humankind? Or was humankind made for the good of the ESA? Now make no mistake about it, the listing of any species adds more rules, more hoops to jump through, more time and costs from everyone, from our farmers and ranchers, our oil field workers, our utility linemen, who are building out new power poles and electric lines to get wind-generated electricity out to more populated states. The ESA is just another weaponized tool that this president uses to attack rural America. And this move's not surprising, considering the president recently vetoed the bipartisan resolution to strike down the WOTUS rule. This White House continues to push policies and resurrect taxes that disproportionately hurt rural America. For over 20 years now, federal, state, and private landowners have voluntarily collaborated with Fish and Wildlife Services to conserve the lesser prairie chicken and its habitat. These partnerships have already resulted in conservation agreements covering roughly 15 million acres of potential habitat for species. To list the bird now, after all the conservation effort, sends a message to stakeholders that no matter how much good work you do, the hammer will still fall. The heavy-handed government will still step in and list species under the ESA and attempt to regulate your industry out of existence, all in the name of climate. The federal government thinks it knows best when it comes to conservation, but this law continues to fail its most basic mission, recovering and delisting species. Despite billions of dollars spent in the name of the ESA, less than 2% of all listed species have been removed from its ESA protection since 1973. Just 2%. Through a combination of public and private efforts, the lesser prairie chicken is better protected now than ever. Listing them as threatened or endangered will not provide any additional conservation benefits above what already exist. Now, as this chart shows, while their prairie chicken numbers tend to follow rainfall, they've been growing since the Obama administration first attempted to list the bird in 2014. No one in this body wants to see this beautiful bird go extinct. As a matter of fact, we're fighting to preserve it. My hope is that one day, once again, my grandchildren can hunt lesser prairie chickens like their great-great-grandfathers did. Listen, no oil producer, no rancher, no farmer, no wind energy producer wants the demise of the lesser prairie chicken. That's why voluntary partnerships have worked and are working. Just like all my fellow Kansans, I'm committed to saving our environment for future generations. To share some wise words from one of my friends, and I quote him, we are passengers on this planet, not captains, end quote. And we need to continue to work with Mother Nature and not punish hardworking Americans. A listing of this species now will only slow down and drive up the cost of our wind energy exports from Kansas, which shares many of the same range. The listing will also push oil and gas development to countries that have long track records of violating human rights or the extraction of these important and necessary energy sources in a manner much more harmful to the environment than those utilized by American producers. Now, whether it's gas or diesel or wind energy, 
This decision to list the chicken would increase the cost of energy. It would federalize millions of acres of ranch lands and expand the regulatory burden on our farmers and ranchers, ultimately increasing the cost of food. But for what? An attempt to protect a species by an agency has only successfully recovered 2% of the species it has listed. No thanks. The local communities have and will continue to do what's best for the bird, and more importantly, for the environment, through ongoing proven conservation efforts. Conservation efforts passed on from one generation of farmers and ranchers to the next. This administration ignores the impact that overall regulation has on American industries. And I hear this from everyone who visits my office. The cost of this administration rules and regulations already outpaced the two administrations, the last two administrations combined, with $363 billion in rules so far. Since January 1st of this year alone, that number is $148 billion. Under this administration, the annual paperwork burden on business has increased to over 220 million hours. Since January 1st, that number is approaching 50 million hours. Indeed, a red tape of nightmare for businesses. This resolution is one of many vital steps the Senate GOP is taking to unleash the economy from the bureaucratic harassment that the White House has deployed. I'm asking you to join me in applauding rather than punishing voluntary conservation efforts and support the joint resolution for congressional disapproval of the Lesser Prairie Chicken listing. Thank you, and I yield back. Madam President. Senator from Wyoming. I ask unanimous consent to yield back all time and that the vote begin immediately. Is there an objection? objection. Without objection. Under the previous order, the joint resolutions are considered read a uh, third time. The question occurs on passage of H.J. Res. 39. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Booker. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Braun. 
Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mrs. Britt, Mr. Brown, Mr. Budd, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Cabateau, Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Yeah. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz. Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibram, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Ms. Arono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lujan, Ms. Lummis, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Asa, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Risch, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Vance, Mr. Warner, Mr. Warnock, Ms. Warren, Mr. Welch, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young.
Senators voting in the affirmative. Barrasso, Blackburn, Cotton, Kramer, Daines, Marshall, Peters, Scott of Florida, Tester, Vance, Wicker. Mr. Wyden, aye. Senators voting in the negative. Cardin, Cortez Masto, Duckworth, Gillibrand, Hassan, Lujan, Menendez, Reed, Rosen, White House. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, aye. So Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rounds, aye. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, aye. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, aye. Stabenow, Miss Stabenow, I. Mr. Young, Mr. Young, I. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, aye. 
Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Heinrich, no. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Tuberville, aye. Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith, no. Mrs. Shaheen, Mrs. Shaheen, no. Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Ossoff, no. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, aye. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, no. Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, aye. Mrs. Murray, Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Carper, Mr. Carper, no. Mr. Padilla, Mr. Padilla, no.
Mr. Hickenlooper, Mr. Hickenlooper, no. Ms. Warren, Ms. Warren, no. Mr. Romney, Mr. Romney, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, aye. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, no. Ms. Lummis, Ms. Lummis, aye. Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schmidt, aye. Mr. Cassidy, Mr. Cassidy, aye. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Mullen, Mr. Mullen, aye. Mr. Rish, Mr. Rish, aye. Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, aye. Mr. Welch, Mr. Welch, no.
Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mrs. Hyde Smith. I. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, no. Mr. Braun, Mr. Braun, I. Mrs. Cavito, Mrs. Cavito. Mr. Booker, Mr. Booker, no. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, no. Brett, Mrs. Brett, I. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, I. Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, I. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, no.
Mr. Lankford, Mr. Lankford, aye. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. King, Mr. King, no. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, no. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, no. Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Klobuchar, no. Mr. Warnock, Mr. Warnock, no. Mr. Bud, Mr. Bud, aye. 
Mr. Manchin, Mr. Manchin, aye. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kelly, no. Ms. Murkowski, Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, aye. Ms. Ernst, Ms. Ernst, aye. Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Baldwin, aye. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, aye. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schatz, no. 
Mr. Fetterman, Mr. Fetterman, I. Miss Cinema, Miss Cinema, no. Mr. Kane, Mr. Kane, no. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley, aye. Mr. Haggerty, Mr. Haggerty. Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Ricketts, aye. Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Cantwell, no. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, aye. 
Mr. Cruz. Mr. Cruz. Aye. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders, no. Mr. Rono, Mr. Rono, no. The yeas are 56, the nays are 41, and the joint resolution is passed. Time is yielded back. Question occurs uh, on passage of How about down? The question occurs on passage of SJ Res 9. Is there a sufficient second? 
appears to be. There appears to be. Okay. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun. Is it the prairie chicken one? Yes, it is. This is a lesser, not the prairie chicken. Yes, it is. She got me, Tony. I did, I did. Mr. Mr. Brown, Mr. Bud. Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito. Mr. Carden. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons. Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lujan, Ms. Lummis, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Risch, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Vance, Mr. Warner, Mr. Warnock, Mr. 
Ms. Warren, Mr. Welch. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Britt, Cassidy, Cornyn, Kramer, Cruz, Graham, Haggerty, Hawley, Hyde-Smith, Lankford, Lee, Lummis, Manchin, McConnell, Ricketts, Romney, Rubio, Schmidt, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Sullivan, Thune, and Tillis. Senators voting in the negative. Bennett, Booker, Cantwell, Cortez Masto, Fetterman, Hassan, Heinrich, Hirono, Kane, Klobuchar, Ossoff, Rosen, Sanders, Schatz, Cinema, Tester, Warren, Welch, and Wyden. Mr. Grassley, aye. Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Padilla, no. Mr. Vance, aye. Mr. Cardin, no. Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Durbin, no. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mrs. Capito, aye. Mr. Brasso, aye. Mr. Brown, no. Mr. Murphy, no. Mr. Bud, aye. 
Mr. Johnson I. Mr. Warnock, no. Mr. Mullen, no. Mr. Mullen, I. Mr. Kelly, no. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Young, aye. Mr. Wicker, aye. with a Mr. King no Mr. Cotton, I. Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith, no. Mr. Bozeman, I. Ms. Ernst, I. Stabenow, no.
Miss Collins, I. Mr. Rish, aye. Mrs. Murray, no. This is Gillibrand. No. Mr. Paul, I. Mr. Moran, I. Mr. Reed, no.
Mr. Merkley, no. Mr. Tuberville, aye. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Rounds, aye. Mr. Carper, no.
Jane's eye. Ms. Duckworth, no. Mr. Lujan, no. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Braun, aye. No. Aye. <coughs> Mr. Schumer, no. No. 
Mr. Hickenlooper, no. Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mr. Menendez, no.
it. I don't know what everybody's panicked about. It hasn't even been an hour yet. Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Marshall, aye. On this vote, the yeas are 50 and the nays are 48, and the joint resolution is passed. Under the previous order, the Senate will resume executive session. The question occurs on the Sioux nomination. Is, is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braum, Mrs. Britt, Mr. Brown, Mr. Budd, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capito, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons. Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, 
Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Langford, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lujan, Ms. Lummis, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Risch, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Vance, Mr. Warner, Mr. Warnock, Ms. Warren, Mr. Welch, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. Senators voting in the affirmative. Baldwin, 
Cantwell, Cardin, Carper, Coons, Cortez Masto, Duckworth, Durbin, Fetterman, Graham, Hassan, Heinrich, Hickenlooper, Kane, Kelly, King, Manchin, Menendez, Murkowski, Murray, Ossoff, Reed, Sanders, Schatz, Schumer, Cinema, Stabenow, Tillis, Van Hollen, Warren, and Welch. Senators voting in the negative. Britt, Capito, Cassidy, Cornyn, Danes, Fisher, Johnson, Lee, Marshall, Moran, Mullen, Risch, Rounds, Schmidt, Scott of Florida, Thune, Wicker, and Young. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, aye. Mr. Wyden, Mr. Wyden, aye. Mr. Bud, Mr. Bud, no. Mr. Booker, Mr. Booker, aye. Ms. Ernst, Ms. Ernst, no. Mr. Langford, Mr. Langford, no. Mr. Braun, Mr. Braun, no. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, no. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, no. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Ms. Lummis, Ms. Lummis, no. Mr. Romney, Mr. Romney, no. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Barrasso, no.
Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, I. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, I. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, no. Mr. Luhan, Mr. Luhan, I. Mr. Merkley, Mr. Merkley, I. Mr. Casey, Mr. Casey, I. Ms. Collins, Ms. Collins, I. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, no. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, I.
Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, aye. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, no. Mr. Warnock, Mr. Warnock, aye. Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, aye. Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith, aye. Mr. Tester, Mr. Tester, aye. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, no. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, aye. Mrs. Blackburn, Mrs. Blackburn, no. Mr. Cotton, Mr. Cotton, no. Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters, aye.
Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Klobuchar, aye. Ms. Rosen. Ms. Rosen, aye. Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blumenthal, aye. 
Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, no. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley, no. Mr. Badia, Mr. Badia, I. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, no. Mr. Vance, Mr. Vance, no. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, no.
Cruz. Mr. Cruz. No. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. No. Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Tuberville, no. Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mrs. Hyde Smith, no. Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Ricketts, no. Nomination, the yeas are 53. The nays are 43, and the nomination is confirmed. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered made and laid upon the table, and the President will be immediately notified of the Senate's action.
The clerk will report the motion to invoke cloture. Cloture motion. We, the underside and senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, do hereby move to bring to a close the debate on the nomination of Executive Calendar Number 125, LaShonda A. Hunt of Illinois, to be United States Dis District Judge for the Northern District of Illinois, signed by 20 senators. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on the nomination of LaShonda A. Hunt? There will be order in the Senate, please of Illinois to be United States District Judge for the Northern District of Illinois shall be brought to a close. The yeas and nays are mandatory under the rule. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mrs. Blackburn, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Braun, Mrs. Britt, Mr. Brown, Mr. Budd, Ms. Cantwell, Mrs. Capucho. Mr. Cardin, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Cassidy, Ms. Collins, Mr. Coons, Mr. Cornyn, Ms. Cortez Masto, Mr. Cotton, Mr. Kramer, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Danes, Ms. Duckworth, Mr. Durbin, Ms. Ernst, Mrs. Feinstein, Mr. Fetterman, Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Gillibrand, Mr. Graham, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Haggerty, Ms. Hassan, Mr. Hawley, 
Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Hickenlooper, Ms. Hirono, Mr. Hoven, Mrs. Hyde-Smith, Mr. Johnson, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. King, Ms. Klobuchar, Mr. Lankford, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lujan, Ms. Lummis, Mr. Manchin, Mr. Markey, Mr. Marshall, Mr. McConnell, Mr. Menendez, Mr. Merkley, Mr. Moran, Mr. Mullen, Ms. Murkowski, Mr. Murphy, Mrs. Murray, Mr. Ossoff, Mr. Padilla, Mr. Paul, Mr. Peters, Mr. Reed, Mr. Ricketts, Mr. Risch, Mr. Romney, Ms. Rosen, Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rubio, Mr. Sanders, Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schumer, Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of South Carolina, Mrs. Shaheen, Ms. Cinema, Ms. Smith, Ms. Stabenow, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Tester, Mr. Thune, Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tuberville, Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Vance, Mr. Warner, Mr. Warnock, Ms. Warren, Mr. Welch, Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wyden, Mr. Young. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Senators voting in the affirmative. Baldwin, Bennett, Blumenthal, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Collins, Cortez Masto, Durbin, Fetterman, Gillibrand, Graham, Hassan, Heinrich, Hickenlooper, Hirono, Kane, Kelly, Kennedy, King, Manchin, Markey, McConnell, Menendez, Merkley, Murray, Ossoff, Padilla, Peters, Reed, Rosen, Schatz, Cinema, Smith, Stabenow, Tester, Tillis, Warner, Warnock, Warren, Welch, Wyden. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Senators voting in the negative. Barrasso, Blackburn, Bozeman, Braun, Britt, Budd. Capito, Cassidy, Cornyn, Cotton, Crapo, Cruz, Ernst, Fisher, Grassley, Hoven, Hydesmith, Lummis, Moran, Mullen, Ricketts, Risch, Romney, Rounds, Rubio, Schmidt, Scott of South Carolina, Sullivan, Thune, Tuberville, Wicker. Mr. Danes, no.
Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, I. Mr. Booker, Mr. Booker, I. Ms. Markowski, Ms. Markowski, I. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley, no. Mr. Young, Mr. Young, no. 
Mr. Marshall, Mr. Marshall, no. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, aye. Mr. Coons, Mr. Coons, aye. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, aye. Mr. Lujan, Mr. Lujan, aye. 
Klobuchar, Ms. Klobuchar, aye. Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Cantwell, aye. Mr. Lankford, Mr. Lankford, no. 
Mr. Vance, Mr. Vance. No, Miss Duckworth, Miss Duckworth, I. Mr. Scott, Mr. Scott of Florida, no. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, no. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, no.
Mr. Haggerty, Mr. Haggerty. No. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, I. The majority leader. Yes, yes. No, no. We have to, what do you have to vote? On this vote, the yeas are 54, the nays are 42, and the motion is agreed to. The clerk will report the nomination. The Judiciary, LaShonda A. Hunt of Illinois to be United States District Judge for the Northern District of Illinois. Madam President. The Majority Leader. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to legislative session, be in a period of morning business with the Senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. And Madam President. I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes its business today, it stand adjourned until 10 a.m. on Thursday, May 4th. That following the prayer and the pledge, the journal of proceedings be approved to date. The morning hour be deemed expired. The time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day, and morning business be closed. Following the conclusion of morning business, the Senate proceed to executive session to resume consideration of the Hunt nomination post-cloture, and that all the time be considered expired at 11.30 a.m. Further, that following the cloture vote on the Shogan nomination, notwithstanding Rule 22, the Senate resumed consideration of the Gupta nomination, with the time until 1.45 equally divided between the two leaders or their designees, and at 1.45 the Senate vote on the motion to invoke cloture on the nomination. Further, that if any nominations are confirmed, the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table, and the President be immediately notified of the Senate's action. Without objection. For the information of the Senate, there will be two roll call votes at 11.30 a.m. and one at 1.45. And if there's no further business to come before the Senate, I ask that it stand adjourned under the previous order, following the very, very learned remarks of Senator Sullivan. Without objection. Madam President. The Senator from Alaska. Madam President, I thank the Majority Leader for his fine compliment to me <laughs> on the Senate floor about learned remarks. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that very much. Not if you're going to take away your compliment. But no, no, if you're, no. If you're, just, gonna, if you're going to keep it, I will yield. I just want to reserve the right to read the remarks before <laughs> closing debate. Actually, I think, you'll, I think you'll appreciate these remarks. Thank you. I yield the floor, and would, I'm looking forward to the Senator's remarks. Madam President, recently there have been 
numerous articles in the media about the U.S. Navy's lack of amphibious ships. One that I would like to submit for the record, headline, Grounding of U.S. Marine Unit Spots the Lack of Ships in the Asia-Pacific. Objection. Thank you, Mr. President. In this piece, the writer leads with how the 30, 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit a rapid response force of the Marine Corps designed for quick deployment on three Navy ships, what we call an amphibious ready group, how they were forced to abandon a training exercise because the amphibious warships that they're supposed to train on were not available due to maintenance problems. Here's what the article said in part. The Marines, Marine unit's grounded status illustrates the larger obstacles the U.S. is facing as it tries to pivot its military to handle the challenges from China. Overall, defense officials said the Navy doesn't have enough amphibious ships to transport Marines. An essential part of the Marine Corps' mission is to hop from island to island in the Asia-Pacific and harry Chinese forces in the event of a conflict. By the way, Mr. President, the Marines are really good at this. They've been doing it for decades. But they need ships. Another article from Defense News is also a recent one about the lack of amphibious ships and the problem that poses. This one, Mr. President, is from another part of the world, but very recent. The article starts with how hundreds of American citizens were stranded in war-torn Sudan. It says, quote, hundreds of Americans in war-torn Sudan last month needed a way out of the country. But the U.S. Marine Corps, the go-to service for such rescues of American citizens, could not help. The article continued, typically, this kind of mission would be standard for the Navy and Marine Corps amphibious ready groups, a Marine Expeditionary Unit, or what we call in the Marine Corps a MU, a MU ARG, a Marine Expeditionary Unit, an amphibious ready group, three ships, super well trained, special operations capable, can go anywhere in the world, kick the door in, save American citizens. The article continues. But for the Americans who fled the coast in Sudan, the Pentagon sent an auxiliary transport ship that they contracted out, I believe, from another country to shuttle them safely to Saudi Arabia. It was, in essence, a self-evacuation of U.S. citizens. Mr. President, NPR reported that the buses actually took hundreds of Americans to the port of Sudan. Imagine, imagine, my colleagues, what would have happened had that those Americans traveling in contract buses in the middle of a civil war got caught in the crossfire. The article that I just quoted, Mr. President, was entitled, Marines Want 31 Amphibious Ships, The Pentagon Disagrees, Now What? And I'd like to submit that for the record. Without objection. Thank you, sorry. And finally, Mr. President, there was another recent article from the Defense News, and its title was, The Navy is on path to violate the 31 amphibious requirements for amphib ships in 2024. Now, Mr. President, this is what I wanted to get to. Last year, in the Armed Services Committee, we held a number of hearings with the Navy and the Marine Corps saying, what is the minimum number of amphibious ships that would enable the Marine Corps to do its global force response mission? The minimum number. 
After many hearings, after much discussion with the Marines and Navy, we came up in a bill of mine with a minimum of 31 ships. Mr. President, this bill in the Armed Services Committee last year passed unanimously. Every Democrat and every Republican voted for it. The law now reads as follows. I know this is a little small, but here is the new United States Code that has the new language. It says, the naval combat forces of the U.S. Navy shall include not less than 11 operational aircraft carriers and not less than 31 operational amphibious warships, of which not less than 10 shall be amphibious assault ships, what we call in the Marine Corps big deck assault ships that can carry helicopters and Ospreys and Harriers and now F-35 Bravos. That was the law. That passed. The President signed it. Here's the problem, Mr. President. The United States Navy is violating the law. The, viol the United States Navy is treating that law, 31 amphibs, a minimum, as a suggestion from the Congress, as an option from the Congress. How do I know? Because we had a hearing two weeks ago on the Armed Services Committee, and the Secretary of the Navy essentially said, we're looking at different options for the President's budget on how many amphibs that the Navy is going to have. And currently, the Navy presented a budget that doesn't have 31 amphibs. I had some cross words with the Secretary of the Navy, the CNO of the Navy, because they're violating the law. And I will tell you, Mr. President, my Democratic and Republican colleagues on the Armed Services Committee were supportive of what I was saying. We had a hearing on the Armed Services Readiness Subcommittee yesterday. The Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Franchetti, said that the Navy was, quote, studying the issue. Mr. President, the Navy can't study the issue anymore. The Navy needs to follow the law. The United States Congress has done the studies. We need the ships. But here's what the Navy presented to the Armed Services Committee two weeks ago. They provided us their 30-year shipbuilding plan for the Navy. Right here is the 31 amphib ship statutory minimum that is required by the law. Here's the Navy shipbuilding plan for the next 30 years. You're seeing the numbers. These are different options. Plan one, plan two, plan three. You might notice the Navy never gets the 31 amphibs. So the Secretary of the Navy, the CNO of the Navy, the Vice CNO of the Navy came to the Congress in the past two weeks and said, ah, your 31 amphib ship requirement, we're going to ignore it. Ah, eh, your 31 amphib ship requirement, Congress of the United States of America, we're going to violate that. Mr. President, this is unacceptable. The United States Navy, the Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of Defense should not be thumbing their nose at the Congress. And worse, they should not be violating the law and not, not trying to abide by the law. They're saying for 30 years, we are going to ignore the Congress and we are going to ignore the laws of the United States of America. This cannot happen. This cannot happen. Mr. President, let me end with this. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, whether you are a hawk on defense issues or a dove on defense issues, if you are a United States Senator, 
This should make you really mad. This should make you really mad. Last year, the Congress spoke, and again, on the Armed Services Committee, on which I serve, it was unanimous. Every member of that committee who'd studied the issue said, at a minimum, the Navy needs 31 amphibs so the U.S. Marine Corps can do its mission around the world. Everybody agreed. We passed the law. The Navy, the Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of Defense are thumbing their nose at this body, are breaking the law as we speak, are intending to break the law for the next 30 years. That's their 30-year shipbuilding plan. Never hits 31 ships. But here's the worst thing they're doing, Mr. President. And this is a real serious issue. They're putting the lives of American citizens at risk. Why do I mean that? Well, let me end where I began. Sudan, rescue of American citizens. Again, normally that is a mission tailor-made for the United States Marine Corps, whether in an embassy or another part of a dangerous part of the world. It's what we call a non-combatant evacuation operation, a NEO. The Marines do them all the time. Bring up their amphibs, launch helos, launch support, craft, helicopters, fighters if they need the air support, the capability of a MU-ARG to go rescue American citizens, a lot of them is unsurpassed by any service in the world. The U.S. Marines do it all the time. But guess what they can't do it without, Mr. President? They can't do it without amphibious ships. And right now, we don't have enough. So we dodged a bullet two weeks ago in Sudan. American citizens put on buses and driven across dangerous parts of Sudan in a civil war for hours after hours and got to a port, self-evacuated, on some other country's ships. We are so lucky that those Americans did not get killed or wounded. Did not get killed or wounded because there was no Marine Corps to rescue them. So Mr. President, I'm gonna keep raising this issue. Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Navy, today, they are violating the law. Today, they have no intention of meeting this 31 amphib ship requirement, and American citizens are at risk. And the next time, we might not be so lucky. The next time Americans somewhere around the world need to be rescued, the next time an enemy of our country does something nefarious to our citizens or our national interests, and we don't have the ability to respond as a Marine Corps because we don't have the ships, we're going to know who's responsible. I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the Senate stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow.